and we're back. And if you're joining us right now, we are starting our first conversation for this morning. And as we said before the break, uh, our first conversation focuses uh, mainly around the uh, resumption of the Commission of Inquiry by the government of Belize. And this was, uh, of course, started back in February of this year and has been on pause for a number of months. Joining us, we have the chairman of the commission, um, Andrew Marshalek. Good morning. Morning. And thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate uh, the time uh, that you've taken to come and discuss this. Now, um, perhaps we can just start by uh, giving a summary of perhaps where, we've, uh, where we are today, given all that has occurred uh, when the commission uh, started and um, what uh, ha and yeah, let's just start with what, what ha what's happened so far. Well, we had a very public derailment, as mm -hmm. you can recall. Dramatic end. <laughs> yes, uh, I think everybody is well aware of what happened um, uh, during the course of the commission proceedings. The whole issue of the cutting of public service wages um, arose and, and the relationship between government and the unions became strained. Mm -hmm. And the unions were, of course, participating in the commission. They had been one of the, the persons who had requested it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And uh, their commission member had indicated that given the impasse that had arisen between the unions and the government, that they would no longer be participating in the commission. Mm -hmm. And just around the same time as well, um, there was news of, of the sales of some airplanes, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that only served to, to make matters worse. Um, so they took their decision and they communicated it at the commission hearing that they would not sit until that relationship improved. Um, uh, so the commission decided that given that one of three would not be available to sit, it would not sit until it was fully constituted again. Mm -hmm. um, in July, the unions formally indicated to me that they were prepared to sit again, and we scheduled a hearing for the 16th of August, mm -hmm. hopefully to pick up where we left off. So is that uh, to assume that that means the, the unions are now in a, as you said before, there was a strain on the relationship, um, so does that mean that they're now uh, in a better place? Well, I, I can't speak to that, but what it means is that they no longer take the view that whatever that relationship is, is, is of sufficient weight to mm -hmm. warrant their decision not to participate. Mm -hmm. So it may be that they're not happy, but they've decided that this needs to be finished as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think part of their, um, their leaving was to make a statement at that point in time, which they succeeded in making. Mm -hmm. What are your yeah. thoughts on, on how things came to an end at that point? Th there were two things, and we can focus on uh, you know, making the statement and, and the, the plug being pulled on, on the proceedings mm -hmm. in, in the way that it was. But it, the core issue was really speaking of investigating past actions that the unions alleged were still taking place. Um, well, I believe there were some sales of airplanes. Mm -hmm. There were sales of airplanes in the past, but the transgressions that we were looking at had more to do with motor vehicles. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think some 112 instances of sales were being looked at um, in detail by the Commission. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there seems to be, and it's clear from the proceedings, from the testimony of the witnesses so far, including the prim former Prime Minister and the Financial Secretary, that there weren't um, clear rules being followed mm -hmm. in the disposal of, of motor vehicles in particular. Mm -hmm. um, just asking people to point and identify the rules presented a problem. Nobody can show you where they are. You could pick up lots of little pieces here and there, but there seemed to be no, no cohesive approach as to how to dispose of assets to secure the best advantage, economic advantage for, for the people of Belize. Mm -hmm. And would you say that that is uh, so, f or the lack of, let's say, procedure, or, or I, <coughs> I don't know, maybe even propriety, mm -hmm. um, so has been uh, the biggest revelation from the, commission, uh, from the uh, proceedings so far? Um, yes. When, when we started looking into it, you could discover certain rules that apply. Mm -hmm. There were some rules in the Finance and Audit Reform Act, for instance, 
which speaks to procurement, which includes, um, and there's a section on the sale of assets, and it speaks to, you hear it all the time, um, three types of tender, proce tender procedures, the open tender, the selected tender, and the limited tender that was supposed to use to dispose of these assets. Those were completely ignored, um, hardly even mentioned, so that even the law that governs this type of activity, for some reason, wasn't being heeded, not even in the slightest. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at, at the scope of work that has been done so far from the commission, um, would you say that this is still an exercise that will prove to be productive for a move towards good governance? I think it has already. How so? It has raised awareness as to the importance of these types of activities to the bottom line. Um, the sale by the government, the present government of the three airplanes raised such a furor. Uh, it drew attention that nobody would have paid attention to two or three years ago. And they drew that attention because the commission had raised awareness that there's and the unions had raised, raised awareness as that there are ways to do these types of things and they're being ignored. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it has had an impact already. Um, I think it can have further impact, um, but I think its, its main impact has been had. I think the, the finishing off of the witnesses um, and the exposure of exactly the sales, the individual, the details of the individual sales that took place mm -hmm. will only um, strengthen people's resolve for the need to reform that area mm -hmm. and for, for proper rules to be put in place and followed um, when government undertakes on mm -hmm. that kind of activity. And, we, and then we speak uh, about you know, this sort of impact, but I think uh, a lot of our viewers are also are going to be uh, are also thinking that um, you know whether there's also going to be uh, consequences faced by those who did if there was wrongdoing and the scope for what uh, you know recovery if any um, penalties mm -hmm. that there's going to be faced that's that's I think the first question that a lot of people are going to have. Well, the commission is a is a fact-finding body, mm -hmm. so it's to investigate and disclose to everybody in a very public way exactly what happened mm -hmm. and it can certainly make recommendations but it goes no further than that in terms of holding um, people guilty of wrongdoing accountable um, we fall right back to the existing institutions um, mm -hmm. that have always been responsible for doing that um, and we see those institutions already being challenged um, we see reports for instance of the wrongdoing in the Ministry of Works, Minister Montero, formal reports to the police, moves to the DPP. I, it seems to have just um, fallen by the wayside. Um, I think it, it demonstrates as well a need for, for us to carefully look at um, those institutions that are responsible for holding wrongdoers accountable and asking ourselves why is it that they're unable to function the way they were intended. There were also complaints to the Integrity Commission. I haven't heard a peep from, from them. Mm -hmm. Now, what is your hope? I mean, we, we have seen the interviews that have, have taken place already because it is uh, publicly um, aired. And you've had some cooperative witnesses. You've had some that mm -hmm. are very barefaced to say that this is basically just a, a situation that has been a general practice. And it's not something that Belizeans didn't know. We're not happy with, not satisfied. Mm -hmm. um, but it is something that people kind of know to be a common practice. And you've had others who basically don't remember anything. So my question is, how are you going to prove, if you don't have cooperative witnesses, um, the details of where the errors were made? Where errors are made are, are are really right in front of you. You don't really have to go anywhere to see them. Mm -hmm. In fact, you could stand off a mile off and see them. Um, our problem lies in the culture of acceptance. For us to be able to look at a mile off, see wrongdoing taking place, mm -hmm. and somehow justifying to ourselves um, 
or inactivity or indifference towards it. So we will see the wrongdoing happen. We will look the next way and pretend as if it isn't. Mm -hmm. But it's not because you can't prove it. In fact, most of these things are hardly sophisticated. <laughs> you scratch the surface and they drop right, they fall right apart. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not really about that. It's about why it is that we as a people are so willing to accept and look the other way when it happens and to pass it off by saying, well, it's always been happening, it'll never change. And certainly if the population adopts that approach, it will in fact never change. Well, I think sometimes experience becomes a, a guide for the skepticism that develops. And when we look at previous commission of inquiries where we've seen damning information being presented, yeah. um, and it does in fact cause an upset in the public, there's very little action that comes thereafter. Certainly, but th those commissioners of inquiry did their job. You saw it. They exposed the wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. It is not for them to investigate with a view to charge or prosecute crime. That's police. It's not their view to, to prosecute in court, to identify charges and to lay them in court. That's for the DPP. It's not the role of the commission to identify wrongdoing by those who link public office breaches of codes of ethics, mm -hmm. um, fundamental breaches of law, and to hold them accountable in their capacity as elected or public officers. That's for the Integrity Commission. There are bodies responsible and charged with significant statutory power to deal with these things. What we see is a repeated um, inaction on the part of them. And you have to ask yourself why that is. But that is not, you can't lay that at the, the foot of the commissions of inquiry. Commissions of inquiry are there to poke the facts, throw it out so that we have, in a public way, a very public understanding of what happened. The consequences that flow from it are for the normal institutions that have to deal with that type of consequences to take action. Now you have said before, um, I, I think in a prior interview, that really and truly uh, there is blame all around from, mm -hmm. from the public who elects the officials um, to the public officers who are involved. Expand on that for me. Yes, um, the kinds of wrongdoing that we see taking place, no one person can do it and get away with it. Mm -hmm. uh, a minister can't walk in a government ministry, direct that a public, sur a public works bulldozer be transported to my private farm, leave it there for three years, have fuel being delivered from the ministry every week, have workers being transported to and from every day to work his private business. And everybody at the ministry can sit and pretend as if it's only the minister's fault. There are so many administrative structures in place designed to catch and prevent that kind of activity. Mm -hmm. It should have been caught from the financial side by the financial officer, from the management side by the CEO. It should have been caught, I mean, at multiple, multiple levels mm -hmm. so that you can only do that and get away with it if all of that breaks down. Mm -hmm. Now, how does all of that break down at the same time? It, it doesn't. It's deliberate. That's, 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 <laughs> that's how they have it. That's how it is functioning or not functioning. Mm -hmm. So you have a systemic issue, and all of us play a role in that issue, in, in that system. Um, so we are all, to the extent of our roles that we play, responsible for what happens there. Mm -hmm. And if we as an electric, uh, electorate are prepared to look the other way when those things happen and still put them back into office, then we too are responsible for it. Mm -hmm. So how, uh, as the commission resumes, um, mm -hmm. you know, given it, with, with all that said, how do, how do you, or how does the commission really, um, uh, the fact-finding exercise, how does, uh, how do, how do you ch choose which how do you choose your questions? How do you choose what information is, is going to be relevant for the purposes of the inquiry um, uh, based on, uh, on, on all that we've said? <laughs> well, where we, what we started was uh, we decided early on we'd go from a top-down approach 
because there's historically a tendency to start from the bottom up mm -hmm. and then at the first mm -hmm. sight of wrongdoing you stop and then the top isn't even questioned. So you would have noticed that we started with the Prime Minister and then moved to the Financial Secretary, then the head of the vehicle care unit and then moved down to individual sales and that is what happened. Establishing first what was the policy and procedures and that were supposed to be guiding all of this, um, how it was implemented, um, determining from them what is their knowledge of the extent of the sales that took place. They provided a list 113. That list hasn't reconciled with information from other departments. But it's slightly off, but they provided a list of what they knew had been sold, mm -hmm. uh, 112, 113 files. And it's based on that material that was provided to us that we've proceeded to, to um, call witnesses mm -hmm. and ask questions. So that forms the, that's the core of the activity and the basis for what comes out. Um, the very first one we started was the sale to Hugo Park. Mm -hmm. And when you scratch the surface of a simple sale of a motor vehicle, and look at all that falls out. Mm -hmm. um, so while it, the transactions on the face of them appear simple and straightforward, when you investigate them, even in a cursory way, you're finding all sorts of things um, coming out in front of you. Uh, we see sales to um, ministers of government. We see sales to party officials. We see sales to party faithfuls. We see sales and to other people whom we are not able to identify connections. Mm -hmm. But in all of them, what is consistent is that there's no competitive bidding for any of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody, each purchaser is just handpicked and a price, and there's no systematic way of, of, of mm -hmm. coming up with it. So we see fundamental deficiencies in, in what was done. Yeah. And it's been going on for a long time. So it, these, these practices, as bad as they are, are normalized within the system. Mm -hmm. Of all the information you've uncovered so far, what has surprised you the most? Um, I don't think anybody has really been surprised by what we've, uh, what we've found. Um, as you the say, Belizeans has been aware of that these things have been happening for years. Mm -hmm. I think all that we are able to appreciate is the extent of it. Mm -hmm. And really the, the, the wanton disregard for, for rules. Um, I'm involved in a number of companies in the private sector. And to engage in the disposal of assets mm -hmm. in that kind of way <laughs> is, is, is remarkable. I mean, you wouldn't even consider it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a recipe for ruining your business. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems, and, and we have ruined the finances of public finances. Mm -hmm. But it seems like um, for some reason when we're dealing with tax dollars, these considerations become less important. Mm -hmm. And moving forward with the with the commission of inquiry um you know i think that there is there's a lot of attention in uh the the persons who are to appear before i think it was uh, minister boots martinez that was supposed to appear mm -hmm. the day is that who you're going to resume with um yes we, we tried with the same list yeah. um but i don't believe mr martinez is in the country mm -hmm. yeah. we haven't been able to serve the same people over so okay. it'll, it'll be a different It'll be the remaining people who, were, who we were able to find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you imagine that out of the inquiry, there is sufficient evidence to be able to levy charges against persons involved? Um, you know, the, the breach of the Finance and Audit Reform Act is a criminal offense. We've seen repeated breaches in the past. We've seen $3 billion spent without approval. Um, the sale of a hundred vehicles without um, going through the mandated procedure. It doesn't seem that earth shattering when you compare it to some of the other transgressions in respect of which nothing has been done. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it'll go that far. Um, I can say that breach of the Finance Art Reform Act was part of the reforms introduced in 211 made criminal offenses. Mm -hmm. 
So you don't know if that, I mean, you're saying that there is sufficient information, there is sufficient facts coming oh. out of the inquiry. Oh, it's clear But that you're doubtful that anything will come from it. Well, it, it's not even the case that they acknowledge that these rules should have been followed, but uh, there were these slips, and for one reason or the other, we didn't quite follow it. Is that they were ignored in their entirety okay. from the beginning till the end. Uh, they weren't observed at all as if they don't apply. Mm -hmm. um, that gives rise to a whole different set of considerations. And the question must be asked, how is it that our assets can be managed in a way that ignores the financial rules in such a fundamental way. And I think that um, that, that goes back to, uh, to something that we were talking about a little bit earlier when I was sort of asking the question about how is it that the commission uh, chooses uh, mm -hmm. to proceed. Um, so is it with a view specifically just to identify if there was wrongdoing? Mm -hmm. um, or is there more of a focused approach to say that, well, we know that this wasn't done, or we know, and, and therefore we're going to uh, discover the full extent. <laughs> as, as I said, the Finance Audit Reform Act introduces three types of tendering procedure. The opening tendering procedure, procedure requires that you advertise publicly and invite bids for the asset. I just indicated to you that the entirety, all yeah. of the files, there were no competitive biddings for any of it. When you go move from an open to a selective, all you've done is instead of advertising publicly, you, in, you invite a smaller group to compete for the bid. And when you go to limited, it gets even smaller, can get to one. Um, and that must be justified by the circumstances. It's only in exceptional circumstances that you're able to do that, and in emergencies and that type of thing. What we see is not even the slightest attempt to comply. And that is evident from you open each and all the files. Mm -hmm. it, it's, so it's, it's not even that they were trying to comply. It, it was just simply ignored. So you see yeah. it with, right through the whole batch of files. Mm -hmm. um, and that you see from miles away. You, <laughs> it doesn't require any um, any real scrutiny to uncover that. Yeah, I think when 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 the prices of some of the the vehicles were revealed, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of Belizeans out there who you know are waiting on a bus right now mm -hmm. thought to themselves, had I been offered that price, uh, I would be a, I would be able to to have a vehicle to use and. Of course, and and that's what the tendering procedure is designed to do, not only to select who gets to buy but how much you must pay. Mm -hmm. And the price is determined by some sort of competition in the market between bidders mm -hmm. to buy the vehicles. So if you're, if you're uh, relying on a procedure where a minister gets to just select you know, whatever um, personal subjective criteria he utilizes to choose buyers, um, and the price, there is no real methodology for it. You, you see attempts to make it look as if um, some efforts being made, the, the reliance on customs valuations in a number of limited instances. And, and even that, when you look at the files, <laughs> I mean, it's less than 10, 15% you could find the valuations in. Most mm -hmm. of them don't have any of that. Mm -hmm. um, but the valuations aren't even designed to discover market value. It's, it's just um, a design to to calculate the loss to the revenue from the initial importation um, of the item into the country because government doesn't pay duties. Mm -hmm. So when it, the car is now sold to somebody else, inclusive of all taxes, you want to factor it into the price, the loss that you would have mm -hmm. had from a tax perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but those aren't, aren't designed to discover market value. So there was no real effort to discover market value or to realize market value for any of the cars sold. Nor was there any transparent process by which potential buyers were selected or identified. It just didn't exist. There wasn't even an attempt to do it. Mm -hmm. It was very blatant and, and barefaced, kind of just handpicking your buyers and putting <laughs> a sticker price. <laughs> That's what it is. Yes. <laughs> I mean, and, and as I said, you, you see it from a mile away. It's, it's, it's not even hidden. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. It's not hidden. Um, and I think it stems from acceptance of the fact that this was a correct way of doing it, or a mistaken um, belief that it was a correct way of doing it, uh, or just simply from the lack of will to discover what would be the correct way to do it. Mm -hmm. and there, was, there was no attempt to, to, regular, uh, to establish any formal policy, any formal rules to deal with it. There was an attempt to rationalize what was done after the fact, but the rationalization doesn't really hold true when you look at what was done because it, 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 there really was no method to what was being done there. If somebody wanted to buy and he thought he would make his request would make favor of the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister did sign off on 99% of all of them personally. So it's his personal discretion being um, exercised. If he liked you and wanted you to have it, you would have it. If for some reason he didn't want you to have it, you wouldn't. Let me ask you, you know, the, the unions are, are a part of the commission and we have spoken quite a few times with the PSU about the responsibility of, of public servants or, in, or the involvement of public servants in corrupt practices as what we're seeing before the commission of inquiry. Now, there is what should be done and then there's the reality of it. And the reality of it is that very few workers will stand up against a supervisor or a minister and say, no, there's a, there's a policy for this. Mm -hmm. So in your mind, and from everything you've uncovered so far, how do you envision that there will actually be a change to this systemic problem? Well, that's it. Um, apart from changing rules, we always tend because to want... Because there is a policy and procedure. It's not... Well, well you know, we, we paid a consultant after government changed in 08 to examine procurement policies and he produced a book. I'm sure it wasn't cheap. Mm -hmm. And there is a part that deals with sale of government assets. Mm -hmm. I, could, I uncovered this months afterwards because I kept asking everybody, where are the rules governing this? And nobody can tell me where they are. But the point of the matter is, when you, there is no magic rule that you will create that will fix mm -hmm. the problem because a part of the problem is, is not the rules, but it's the people. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, an economics professor years ago, he, was a, he happened to be a Jesuit priest, and he said, systems are neither good nor bad. People make them good or bad. You put bad people in a good system, they will ruin it. You put good people in a bad system, they make it work. So there's an element of the personnel and the, and the qualities that we bring as people to the application of these rules mm -hmm. that determines whether or not rules work or not. We always seem to be searching for this magic formulation of rules that will fix everything, when the rules themselves can never fix everything. What the other component of it, of it is fixing ourselves and our own value systems mm -hmm. in order to make those rules uh, function as they were designed. Yeah. But sometimes it's beyond that. Sometimes it's protection mechanisms. It's, it's things like uh, what's being dis uh, explored at this point, the Whistleblowers Act, and um, ensuring that if I do speak up, there is a level of protection. Sure, you can make those arguments. But the fact of the matter is that even in the face of whistleblower legislation, with all the protection in the world, if you have people who are content to look the other way, you will get no whistleblowing. Mm. You will get no whistleblowing. So from what you're saying, and, and that's, that's why I started off with where you imagine this will go, it almost feels like an exercise in futility. No, it's not. What it is, is a gradual recognition of the importance of rules, yes, but also the importance of the, the quality of people and the, and the integrity and, and principles of people who get to apply those rules. Um, and a learning that all these things need to be fixed if you expect the whole to work as it should. Uh, I always, you know, I've said before that these rules, we always face problems and think that the solution lies in conceiving a proper rule. Uh, rules, even those that become law, are nothing but words on paper. They mean nothing in and of themselves. It's the institutions and the people who get to apply and enforce them that determine how well they will work, or whether or not they will achieve the intended results. 
So you need to look at it holistically. Mm -hmm. And this overemphasis on rules to solve a problem um, really um, takes away from the importance of developing an appropriate culture mm -hmm. towards uh, these types of activities. Mm -hmm. um, if we have a culture of fiscal discipline instilled, um, a culture that, that gives the importance of spend, that recognizes that every public dollar wasted is an opportunity lost to address poverty, to appreciate the full impact of what those deficiencies result in, why we do not realize the kind of development that we really ought to. Mm -hmm. um, I think as that dawns on us and dawns on society as a whole and takes root, then you will see the kind of cultural shift that you need to see to fix these things. But there's no magic bullet there. There's no magic law that will be passed that will solve it. Um, it just doesn't work that way. Let, let me use that as a, as a jumping point to, to jump into another topic because uh, that's, that's kind of the very same argument against uh, the, the 10th Amendment uh, mm -hmm. that is proposed. That changing the Constitution to ensure that people who are assigned to these oversight bodies um, will change at the appropriate time tied to election cycles mm -hmm. is only trying to, to legislate fixing a problem that shouldn't be there. Um, the Tenth Amendment seeks to limit the terms yes. of appointments on these commissions. These commissions are supposed to be so, so, supposed to be autonomous, supposed to function independently, and serve as a check on executive power within the constitutional scheme. The amendments, as I see it. Um, seek to address a, a problem that was encountered um, in that there was a perception that none of those appointments were truly independent and there may be a basis for it. For instance, the problems they had with the Public Service Commission, the chairman is a past member of UDP cabinet mm -hmm. and the, the commission is stacked with party political officers and, and supporters. So there was this notion that the these bodies were not independent and in order to fix them you would need to have the appointments vacated and then embark on proper or new appointments and I think that is what um, motivated the proposals to change. Now some of the change themselves um, when you look at it might give an appearance of, of impartiality or an appearance of a lack of independence on the commission by coordinating the appointment of the commission with the change of political office. Mm -hmm. um, so there are trade-offs, both sides. But independence goes well beyond, and this is to get back to your original point, to tie it back, it goes well beyond the organizational structure of these commissions. Because apart from the organizational independence, and this is defining the commission and putting it within the organizational structure of government so that it sits off one side and it doesn't take commands from cabinet. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. Um, it's only about one dimension of independence. There's also functional or operational independence and that has to do with money and personnel and resources and the availability of those resources to the commissions to perform the function. You will see that all these commissions, although they're organizationally independent, functionally are still very much captured by the executive in that, and it was demonstrated again by the Public Service Commission, they couldn't even answer correspondence or receive correspondence because they have no office, they have no money, they rely on the public, Ministry of Public Service to do all of that for them. And the minute that was withheld, the commission was paralyzed. So there is no functional or operational independence. And then apart from that, there is also individual independence. And it is, this is staffing these bodies with people who are of integrity and adhere to principles um, and are not swayed by political considerations in the performance of their functions. That is, comes from the culture of the pool of people that you get to 
to put on these commissions. And you don't get to legislate that. And it is really the most important one because it comes back to what I said my professor taught me years ago. Because if you get good people on the bottom, it doesn't really matter what the organizational independence is, and it doesn't matter what the functional independence is. You will get principal decisions um, grounded in integrity, no matter who is put there. Because every Belizean would be guided by the same principles. So the, the reliance on the structural protections, mm -hmm. the organizational protection and the functional protections, really stem from the weakness in the, in the latter one, mm -hmm. the willingness of our people to be influenced by those kinds of considerations, mm -hmm. uh, too easily influenced by it. But by putting the tenure of these commissions tied directly to the amount of time an administration is in office, mm -hmm. we would love to see, I would love to see personally, that we are politically mature enough that a person can be appointed in that position by a partic particular administration, knowing that their time will come to an end when that mm -hmm. administration leaves. However, by virtue of being appointed, you then tie yourself politically, or very often, as we've seen, mm -hmm. which is what is the problem that's being circumvented, it is a politically connected person that is appointed to these posts. Yes, no. Um, so you're, there is make, you're worsening, it may be worsening the problem. There is, it does give, a wrong impression, but giving a wrong impression to fix what is substantive wrong is a decent trade-off. Um, it's hardly as earth-shattering as it's being made out to be, because as I said, even if you look at the functional or operational independence, of it, but it doesn't exist. So if the argument is that these amendments is, are undermining independence of these commissions, when these commissions have and can't function independently, <laughs> What's the purpose of, of, of the criticism? Mm -hmm. If you want to fix the lack of independence, you but, have to go to the heart of the problem. Well, aren't there two separate things? Being mm -hmm. able to function independently as in having a secretariat or staff or, or being able... Having to access to money. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. resources. That's yes. one thing. Yeah. But how long you serve or who, uh, 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 by and appointment is separate. And also, yes, it is separate. And also the quality of the individuals appointed, personal integrity and principles by which they act. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that when you take into all of that into account and look at the whole picture, the whole notion of independence of these bodies is really an illusion. And you point to that illusion and then you point to one little defect in an appointment process that hardly makes a difference um, to suggest that the, the, the sky is falling down is hardly the case. You have far bigger problems there to confront than the term of an appointment. Term of appointment is, is, is hardly here nor there. The quality of the people you put in is, is paramount and can make it function regardless of what the term is. Imagine this. If everybody in Belize were people of integrity and principle and we would all make reasonable decisions and proportional decisions in those functions, whether it's the Public Service Commission, the, the Elections and Boundaries Commission, whichever commission, mm -hmm. All of us would apply those same principles. It doesn't matter which of one of us are appointed, you would still get good decisions out of those bodies. The structural pro protections that you wish to emphasize only becomes important because of the culture. Mm -hmm. If the culture changes, it works fine. We are focused in sen in, in, instead on changing the minutiae of the rules and not looking at the primary reason why these bodies don't function as intended. It has to do mm -hmm. with functional, a lack of functional independence, and this is true even for our courts. When judges want to go on holiday, or when they want to go to a conference, they have to go big the ministry for, for permission to do it, for funding to do it, and that's because that's the ultimately independent institution. There is no functional independence there. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the quality of the people. I would prefer that we focus because I think change comes from each of us mm -hmm. on addressing what we control first, which is that. And I've said it before, if you want people of integrity and principle in office, then raise your children to be people of integrity and principle because they will hold the office um, shortly. 
And so do you but, think that the amendment is a uh, positive development then, uh, g given all that you said, uh, in the way that yeah, I suppose it, it, it seeks to solve this issue, that, these issues? I, I won't decide, characterize it for you, but I'll tell you the pros and the cons, because there are pros and okay. cons. As a democratic so society, you're supposed to be led, government is supposed to comprise or be determined by whom you elect, who the, the populace votes for. Um, when you acknowledge that these bodies, although they should function independently, are in fact a part of government, then you can also come to the conclusion that it promotes democracy for the the. the composition of these bodies to reflect the will of the people through the vote, which is to give the opportunity to those leaders whom we've elected into the office to make those appointments and not be left with a situation where an unpopular ousted leadership made the appointment, but the appointments must persist throughout a significant portion of the claim of the new administration. Mm -hmm. So there is that. On the flip side of it, on the downside, Linking the appointments to the period of office of political office holders gives an appearance that politically appointed people will be appointed. I say appearance because it doesn't necessarily mean that that will be so. Mm -hmm. You can find quality people and it all works fine. So it does create a little risk and a, a, a risk to perception and an and appearance of independence of these bodies. But it's a risk that can readily be managed by reference to how you treat it operationally and how you treat the appointments themselves. So you have to look at all of that as a whole and not just focus on the, the one little characteristic that detracts, that possibly detracts from a notion of independence. It's more important to me to look to see the kinds of people that are put on and whether or not these institutions are empowered and funded and allowed to function as intended, or if it is the case that government will be insisting on decisions being taken certain ways and will be continuously changing commission in order to pro members of the commission in order to secure their will. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can point a, a out. A skeptic will look at the situation and say, well, if there wasn't so much of a challenge in getting some of the commissioners to resign yes. when this new administration had taken office, this perhaps wouldn't be an amendment that would have been brought forward. I, I don't think it would be. And I think it is in large part a reaction to the notion that government was being held hostage in key appointments and key bodies to um, personnel, the whims of personnel appointed by the past administration. And if it were the case that these appointments were properly made and they were functioning in an independent way, um, then they wouldn't have or they shouldn't have been an issue. Mm -hmm. But we see face-offs with, for example, the Comptroller of Customs and the Public Service Commission, where the new administration decided that they favored a particular candidate and the whole administration had topped uh, another candidate and expected him to follow through. And you have the same old um, Public Service Commission um, insisting that it be done a certain way, or, or rather sitting back and not facilitating the change that the government wanted to see. So they see it as an obstacle to um, what the people elected them to do, to, to achieving it. And that is precisely why they were motivated to make the, the amendment. Mm -hmm. when, when you look at the amendment, it, it certainly does achieve that and makes it so that these commissions now are, are vacated with each election cycle. What used to be a gentleman's agreement, it will now be, formal, um, will now be legalized. Yeah, well, I don't even know that it was a gentleman's agreement, but it was certainly an expectation. Um, yes, so now it's, it's, the office is formally vacated and each elected government gets to make their own appointments. Um, the fact that it's coordinated in that way does give an appearance that the appointments might be political, but it doesn't mean that they are. Um, so I think it's more important to see how the appointments are handled than, um, than the coordination of the terms. You know, use, using examples that you have given mm -hmm. to us right here in this conversation, um, 
I in a in a utopian society mm -hmm. where everyone did in fact have that level of integrity despite political affiliation which is fine for people to mm -hmm. have um, that would be ideal mm -hmm. but we understand the mechanics of how things work in this society as All you right. pointed out when we were speaking about commission of inquiry mm -hmm. there is an expectation there are sometimes procedures set out but people still follow through with practices that have been established what makes you think or what makes you feel that in the amendment of the Constitution um, in this manner for these very important oversight bodies that it's going to be any different? Well, I don't know that it will be any different, mm -hmm. but it does give the, oppor the opportunity for a change to take place. Um, I would hope that that kind of change takes place. That's why I'm saying it's more important to look at how the appointments take place and how these bodies are treated in the future, whether mm -hmm. their, their roles are respected and they're empowered um, to do what they were designed to do, mm -hmm. or whether you, you keep seeing an undermining of it um, and a stacking of it with people who just um, will follow whatever um, the political directorate requires. Yeah. Um, that is where our issue lies. But from my perspective, who's uh, the perspective of just a member of the, the, the citizenry in Belize, yeah. Um, the change that I can implement, that I have control over, that I should focus on, is, is really making it sure so that to encourage a, a cultural shift in all of us that doesn't tolerate that kind of, of disposition. Once, once that takes place, uh, the whole problem falls away. Now that's a monumental task and it, it's a generational task. Of course. Um, progress is made incrementally, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still something that we can take personal responsibility for. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in approaching any problem, um, especially problems of, a, of, of that nature, of a governmental systemic nature, we have to focus on what it is that we can do to make it better. And we have the power in our hands to solve it, maybe not tomorrow, but in the next 15 years with the next generation. Mm -hmm. if, if we uphold um, and reward integrity and teach the importance of adhering to certain basic fundamental principles. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, since we have you here, we got you to weigh in mm -hmm. on the 10th. Let's uh, just very quickly, what do you think of the 11th? Um, the 11th is a societal norm, and it's really for society to decide whether or not that is the type of person they want to serve in that type of office. Mm -hmm. There is no universal truth to it. It is what we're prepared to tolerate as a society. Um, I can see that an argument being made that somebody who has been guilty of an offense that has warranted that kind of um, response imprisonment should not be entitled to hold the highest office of the land. I can also see an argument that um, just because somebody did something wrong once doesn't mean he will continue to do it and he may still have positives to contribute. We don't have to toss him away mm -hmm. like a used rug. I can see that. The, the, the truth of it probably lies somewhere in the middle and it's finding, it's finding where it is that we as a society are comfortable and are happy. That's the standard that should be set. So it's something that requires discussion mm -hmm. but it's also something that we can look to others to decide for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have to set that norm mm -hmm. as a people. Yeah. All right. Well, we appreciate okay. the conversation this morning. All right. Thank All you. Right. And we will see uh, how things unfold. What's the formula for the uh, public airing of the commission? Uh, the same. Um, I don't there's expect a, any cuts There's a padlock on, on the cord? <laughs> well, I've never had um, um, <laughs> control over the cord. <laughs> I have to trust that it'll work, but I don't think that error will be made again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know we jest, but it was a very serious thing, and we do hope that we don't see it happening again. Yes, me too. All right. We're right. going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Belizean nurses studying in Taiwan. That's coming up in just a few minutes.